Good morning. My name is Kate Elkington. For those of you who don't know, I am one of the co-directors of the Grand Rounds here at Columbia University Psychiatry Department. Um, and on Zoom today, we have Dr. Christine Denny. Um, so before we start, I just wanted to note a few announcements. Um, so first of all, next week's rounds, uh, we have one, uh, the next in our series of clinical updates. Um, and the title of this uh, clinical updates rounds is Perinatal Mental Health, an update for clinicians. And we will have two speakers, uh, speakers Dr. Elizabeth Vitalson and uh, Dr. Nicole Pacheo. So um, they will be joining us, I believe in person uh, next week. And then before I hand over the, um, the rounds to Dr. Steinglass, I just wanna remind folks on Zoom um, of our protocols. So if you have any questions um, for the speaker, please enter those at any point in the Q&A, not the chat, but the Q&A uh, function of the Zoom webinar. Um, if you are a trainee, please note that you are a trainee as we do like to prioritize those questions. Also, if you would like to ask the question yourself and speak directly with our speaker, please note that at the end of your question and then Christine can temporarily promote you as a panelist and you'll be able to speak directly um, with our speaker today, which we think is much nicer as well. Um, and also just for folks here, there are QR codes in, in case you need uh, continuing education credits. So they're listed at the front and then at the back of the room. So please uh, go ahead and uh, grab those as you need to. And I'm going to turn it over now to Dr. Sanglas. Is there anything, any trick to starting a slideshow here? Is, am I doing it or is Simon doing it? Okay. Okay. Hi. Um, it is my pleasure to be here to introduce today's Grand Rounds, um, which is the Alexander Glassman Memorial Lecture. Um, and the Glassman Lecture is in honor of Dr. Sandy Glassman, a distinguished faculty member who passed away in 2011. Um, Sandy Glassman was an internationally recognized clinical researcher whose work focused on depression and psychopharmacology and his contributions to our knowledge of serious mental illness really changed patient care. In addition, Dr. Glassman was greatly admired as a teacher. And uh, I was mostly a generation or two generations removed from Sandy's direct teaching, but I'm one of the many, many at Columbia who benefited from his mentorship. There's a lot more I could say about both Sandy's scientific contributions and about his mentoring contributions. But this year, I wanna take a moment to talk about Sandy's enduring influence on all of us. I was recently explaining to a colleague about the tree of Sandy's mentorship. And she, of course, thought I meant a sort of generational family tree. And no, no, I explained, um, there is an actual tree. This tree was brought from Sandy's original <laughs> office in some part of old PI that I don't actually know. And as legend has it, the tree was then in a very sorry state. But since Sandy's death, the tree has flourished I suppose it's not actually looking at its best in this picture, but it really has flourished. It has been tended very, um, very uh, dedicated care from Sandy's mentees. It has moved offices, it has been transplanted, um, and it has now provided inspiration to new generations of clinical researchers. So Sandy's spirit is very strong in this building. A generous gift from the Glassman family supports not only this lecture, um, which I will introduce in just a moment, um, but also an annual award given to a trainee for research carried out here at PI. And three of Sandy's mentees, Evelyn Atia, Steve Roos, and Tim Walsh, along with Jeff Miller, invite trainees to submit publications or presentations of research they have carried out while at PI to be considered for the Glassman Award. This year, there are two award recipients, um, Caitlin Lloyd um, and Morgan Firestein. Both of you could come up. Uh, if so, uh, Caitlin's paper is Large Scale Exploration of Whole Brain Structural Connectivity in Anorexia Nervosa, Alterations in the Connectivity of Frontal and Subcortical Networks. And Morgan Firestone, oh, no, 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 there's a picture. <laughs> 
Morgan Firestein's paper is the assessment of neurodevelopment in infants with and without exposure to asymptomatic or mild maternal SARS-CoV-2 infection during pregnancy. And for the titles alone, congratulations. Um, come over here. Congratulations to you both. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's um, grand round speaker, Dr. Jessica Schleider. Wait, um, is the founder and director of the Lab for Scalable Mental Health. Currently, she's an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at Stony Brook. Uh, but in September, she and her lab will move to Northwestern University, where she will be an associate professor of medical social sciences in the Feinberg School of Medicine. Dr. Schleider completed her PhD in clinical psychology at Harvard University in 2018, along with a doctoral internship in clinical and community psychology at Yale School of Medicine. She graduated with a BA in psychology from Swarthmore College in 2012. Um, and in support of her research on brief scalable interventions for depression and anxiety in young people, she has received grant support from the NIH, the National Science Foundation, as well as foundation and industry grant funding. Dr. Schleider has been recognized with numerous awards, including the NIH Director's Early Independence Award, the ABCT President's New Researcher Award, and the Society for Science of Clinical Psychology's Susan Nolan Hoxima Early Career Research Award. Lots of names for lots of awards. Her work has also been featured in multiple media outlets and uh, was she was chosen as one of Forbes 30 Under 30 in healthcare. Dr. Schleider has published more than 95 scientific articles and book chapters. She has created or co-created seven open access single session mental health programs, which have received more than, which have reached more than 35,000 teens and adults to date. Based on these programs, Dr. Schleider and her colleagues wrote a self-help workbook, the Growth Mindset Workbook for Teens. She co-edited the Oxford Guide to Brief and Low Intensity Interventions for Children and Young People, and uh, is I believe excited to announce the uh, the new nonfiction book, Little Treatments, Big Effects, which is coming out this year on how single session interventions and meaningful moments can transform mental health. We're just delighted to have you here to speak to us today. So take it away. One more picture. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone on Zoom. I'm so happy to be able to share my lab's research over the past now five years with you. Um, I'm going to jump right in because we have limited time and a lot to discuss. Uh, grant funding disclosures, um, really fortunate. Uh, our, our group is so fortunate to have support from a variety of resources for this work that is somewhat non-traditional. So we're very grateful that folks have taken a chance on us. So a quick agenda to get started. I'm going to share a little bit about why I believe that brief and scalable interventions are completely essential to the future of mental health care, how our lab, the Lab for Scalable Mental Health, builds and tests mechanism targeted and primarily single session mental health interventions, and how we're continuing to leverage multi-sector partnerships to implement and disseminate our programs to identify how they can best fill gaps in mental health ecosystems. So of course I'm preaching to the choir when I say this, but there's been incredible progress in the last 50, 60 years in the identification of mental health treat treatments that are effective. And at the same time, we have an extraordinarily long way to go before meeting the needs of youth across the country in particular. Um, of the youth in the United States who experience significant mental health concerns, about one in five are estimated to access mental health care uh, of any kind. And of that one in five, only about 20% are expected to receive what we would consider in our field to be best practice full dose of psychotherapy or treatment. To unpack that a little bit more, the average number of sessions uh, designed for evidence-based mental health treatments for young people is between 12 and 16 based on meta-analyses. 
But national insurance reimbursement data tells us that kids are only attending an average of three to four sessions before discontinuing treatment for a variety of logistical, financial, and personal barriers. And moreover, in the US, in Canada, in Australia, Spain, Japan, and the list goes on, the most common number of interactions that folks have in clinical settings for mental health happens to be one. So we haven't done the best job of building interventions that match how people actually interface with systems of care. One proposed solution to this really big challenge is the provider shortage and, and expanding our workforce, right? Uh, of course, that's going to be one piece of the puzzle. However, even in the US, a high income country, provider shortages are too severe to fix access to care problems just through workforce expansion. This is a map generated using publicly available data from HRSA.gov. You can generate your own upsetting map anytime you'd like to. Uh, the areas in medium and dark blue on this map are federally designated mental health care provider shortage areas. The whole map is medium and dark blue. That's not a mistake. That's just the severity of the situation we're facing. And this isn't even taking into account specialists in youth mental health care. Um, it's also the case that even our best gold standard interventions for mental health problems for young people don't always help. They can do something for some people, but don't have a 100% hit rate and aren't always fully effective. These are graphs from a temporal meta-analysis led by John Weiss and colleagues at Harvard University. Uh, disclosure, John Weiss was my graduate advisor, so I'm kind of a fan of his work. Um, but I think these graphs are really important because they show that over time, over the last four or five decades, evidence-based treatments for anxiety in youth have gotten really marginally better, if any better. And evidence-based treatments for depression in young people, the, the effect sizes have actually declined significantly over time. That may reflect methodological advances, uh, more rigorous studies that are occurring now than a couple decades ago, but nonetheless, it shows that there's a lot of room for improvement. Existing treatments also aren't built to match young people's needs for treatment, for convenience, autonomy, and flexibility. First of all, supports aren't located where youth actually seek help. 80% uh, of young people today report that they first seek mental health support online over Google. Uh, that's not where most treatments live, however. Youth are also actively disempowered to access any form of mental health care on their own terms. Um, adolescents in most states in the US cannot access mental health support without um, uh, sort of a referral or consent from a primary caregiver. Um, however, in our research where we waive parent consent requirements, to offer low intensity evidence-based treatments to teens directly. When we ask those teens what gets in the way of accessing mental health support, about a third say their parents. And a national survey by the, Tre the Trevor Project, uh, which just came out yesterday, surveying thousands of LGBTQ teens across the country say that about 40% of youth who cannot access mental health care, identifying as a sexual or gender minority, do not do so because they cannot share their experiences with their families. Treatments also don't fit with how youth want to engage with mental health supports, which is briefly and as needed. When they, when, when they experience a problem, they want help for that problem in the moment, not sort of once a week in, uh, out of sync with when they're actually experiencing acute distress. So there's a real need for well-targeted well and accessible supports that can not only empower youth to access care when and how they want it, but can also augment effects of interventions that already are helpful for some people to some degree, and that can offer something, ideally something with scientific support to the many, many people who would otherwise access nothing at all. And that's where we're hopeful our lab can help fill some of these gaps. Our goals are threefold. We develop brief and primarily single session scalable interventions for mental health problems, primarily in youth, but increasingly across the lifespan identify how those interventions might affect change and how to get them to the folks who are most likely to benefit, which is a really hard problem to solve. And I'll talk a little bit about how we haven't solved it uh, later in this talk. And how to test novel approaches to disseminating these interventions beyond the brick and mortar physical clinics that we know young people are very rarely accessing. I wanna start with a definition because I never learned one in my graduate training. Uh, outside of my own research. So it may be helpful to all get on the same page of what exactly I mean when I say single session intervention or SSI. I mean a specific structured program that intentionally, and that's really key, 
involves just one visit or encounter with a clinic, provider, or program. I say intentionally is key here because attending an initial assessment but not being able to return for further therapy is not a single session intervention um, because the intention for a therapy like that was never that the assessment would be the last visit, right? So in an SSI, everybody, the provider, the recipient is on the same page that we're gonna make the most of this moment we have right now, even if we cannot continue. SSIs may be accessed on one occasion or many occasions. That is, it's a one at a time approach to treatment, treating every interaction as though it could be the last one, not a one and done treatment, as in you wouldn't cap the number of single session interactions that a patient could have. Um, and at the same time, you're optimizing each one for maximum benefit. SSIs may be self-guided, for instance, online digital interventions or human facilitated provider delivered and they may be accessed either within or outside of formal healthcare systems. But in all cases, SSIs drop this often false assumption that clients are definitely going to return for session two, while instilling the belief that's accurate based on the research that meaningful change is in fact possible at any moment, including this one. And this isn't just an idea. There is decades of research telling us that SSIs can in fact significantly reduce youth mental health problems. This graph is from a meta-analysis that I led in uh, graduate school back in 2017 um, after experiencing very uh, much frustration in community mental health clinics where folks just weren't able to return for additional sessions after their assessment, which was often disappointing because they just got asked a bunch of questions. They didn't get anything that helped. So I was curious, is there something we can intentionally do in this first session that people have studied that could in fact give somebody something they could benefit from even if they're not able to return. As it turns out, a lot of people had been asking this question for many decades already. Um, and this meta-analysis included 50 randomized controlled trials of single session mental health interventions for youth mental health problems. And on this graph, I wanna compare the effects of single session and full length youth psychotherapies. The red bars are the average effects on mental health symptoms, anxiety, conduct problems, and depression for full length youth mental health interventions, which averaged 12 to 16 sessions based on my graduate mentor's meta-analysis. Uh, and the blue bars are the average effects on average of mental, on mental health systems of single session youth mental health interventions for those same problems. Those bars were a lot further together than, uh, a lot closer together than we expected them to be. And um, after making sure many, many times that there were no coding errors involved here, um, we concluded that maybe there's something meaningful we can do in one session, and it seems really important to figure out what exactly that is and how we can make it happen more uh, consistently. I want to emphasize at this point that SSIs cannot and should not replace other forms of mental health care treatment. But what I think they're uniquely equipped to do is to bridge otherwise unfillable gaps in systems of care that traditional interventions were never designed to fill and never will fill unless they are dramatically changed. So over the last five years, since I started our lab, we've done a lot of work in this area, exploring whether we can make this happen. Um, and today our lab's evidence-based single session interventions have served more than 35,000 people, about 9,000 through grant-funded clinical trials, more than 26,000 through our nonprofit and community partnerships. We've been really fortunate to work with teams who've been generous to dedicate their time to culturally adapting and translating these interventions that we've put together into several languages. Um, we receive funding to co-design and adaptation for LGBTQ teens specifically, and I'll share a little more about why in a moment. Um, and all of our interventions are free and the de-identified from uh, data from these studies are public in order to facilitate not just disseminable treatments, but um, uh, accumulative science in this area. These are some of the interventions that we've developed. I'll touch on most of these today. Um, but each SSI essentially is designed to target a modifiable short-term belief or behavior that we know from experimental research in psychology is somewhat modifiable by a short-term behavioral intervention, whereby short-term improvements in these mechanistic outcomes can spur upward spirals over time of meaningful longer-term change in symptom outcomes that we care about. And I wanna start in sharing our work with you uh, in, in uh, uh, walking through some of our research on SSIs for adolescent depression, which is really where I began this journey into SSI research. 
So two types of SSIs to date have shown promise for reducing symptoms of youth depression. One is something we now call Project Personality. This is a 30, 20 to 30 minute online self-guided program that is essentially designed to increase a sense of hope and malleability beliefs by teaching that symptoms like depression are malleable rather than fixed simply because how, how the brain is built. Neuroplasticity embeds all in all of us the potential for, for change, even if that change is challenging. In clinical and um, school-based samples that are not clinic referred, we've seen that this intervention significantly reduces uh, depression symptoms over uh, four to nine month follow-up periods compared to active uh, placebo controls. The other kind of SSI that has been shown to benefit youth depression symptoms, probably unsurprisingly to this audience, is a behavioral activation program. The ABC project is our version of it. It's called um, Action Brings Change. Originally, single session BA interventions were delivered in college counseling settings uh, to manage some overflow and really lengthy waiting lists um, in those settings in particular. And more recently, BA SSIs have been adapted for self-guided administration for adolescents, both within and outside of the United States. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, our lab sort of came together and, and tried to figure out how the interventions that we had tested in smaller scale RCTs already might be useful uh, during a time when so many young people were actively losing access to supports they previously had been uh, benefiting from. So we received NIH funding um, to test whether these two different single session interventions, which presumably target different uh, short-term targets, um, project personality, teaching malleability beliefs about depression, and the ABC project, teaching behavioral activation, whether these could reduce depression symptoms, hopelessness, anxiety, COVID-related trauma, and a host of other outcomes of interest in a nationwide sample of adolescents experiencing subclinical or higher depression symptoms. This paper has been published. You can read it. It's in Nature Human Behavior, and also our analytic code data and pre-registration are all publicly available. So if you see uh, data points or variables that you want to learn more about in this sample, um, that's why we made the data public. So please feel free to explore. There were 2,452 adolescents in this clinical trial. They were ages 13 to 16, and all of them were recruited over Instagram. How did we do that? Um, well, we obtained an IRB waiver for parent consent. Um, I say that in about four seconds up here, but it took a couple, a couple years <laughs> to actually do. Um, but eventually we were able to get on the same page with our IRB that it was an ethical, uh, it was ethically important for us to offer low intensity evidence-based interventions to teens who would most likely otherwise access absolutely nothing or TikTok uh, as an alternative. 87% of our sample met cutoffs for depression based on the CBI. 60% endorsed self-injurious thoughts or behaviors, 80% endorsed adverse childhood experiences, and a fifth reported loss of basic needs during the pandemic, like housing or food. So this was a high severity sample in real need of support. Most were female in terms of sex assigned at birth, um, but to our uh, joy, <laughs> we found that 80% of our sample identified as sexual minority young people and 20% as gender diverse youth, and about half as racial and ethnic minority young people, which to us is proof positive that offering supports directly to adolescents and circumventing that barrier that many minoritized teens report of not being able to discuss mental health with their families is one of many really important avenues to increasing access to support in these populations. Of course, even though parents weren't involved, we took several steps to address risk and safety. We offered everyone a six page resource list of mental health supports that are free and accessible with or without parent involvement to adolescents in the US. We validated and offered a self guided safety planning tool to anyone who endorsed non zero suicidal ideation or self injurious thoughts or behaviors in the study. So they could make a safety plan that would be quite similar to what I as a clinical psychologist would do with someone if I identified risk at an assessment with them. There was also an option to request outreach from our team if people felt unsafe or wanted help navigating these supports. About 2% of teens in the study uh, ended up requesting outreach from us. And the vast majority of those teens wanted to talk to somebody, but there was no actual risk. <laughs> um, and so that was uh, comforting to us in that it seems feasible and sustainable to offer these kinds of resources safely on a broad scale. 
Um, after being uh, screened into the study, youth were randomized into one of three intervention conditions, project personality, the malleability beliefs SSI, the ABC project, or the sharing feelings project, which is our placebo active control. All of these interventions for this study were housed within Qualtrics uh, survey platform, which is, su is surprisingly flexible um, and user friendly when you know a little bit of HTML. So I highly recommend it for online self-administered intervention studies. Immediately before and after, we collected assessments on symptoms and immediate outcomes that we expected to uh, predict future changes in depression, anxiety, like a change in hope and a change in perceived agency. In past trials, we found that immediate changes in those outcomes actually predict the magnitude of future changes of depression and anxiety symptoms. So we do think those immediate shifts are important, potentially prognostic predictors of symptom change in response to these programs. And then we followed up three months later with a 72% retention rate to see how these interventions might have shaped symptoms over time. In designing self-guided single session interventions, we've um, sort of converged on several elements or design features that underlie uh, successful interventions that reliably shift these short-term outcomes that we care about, drawn mostly from social psychological research and even marketing research um, and on persuasive me uh, messaging. We use ideas from brain science and really science more broadly to teach and normalize the concepts that we're conveying in the intervention to strengthen buy-in. That way for adolescents who are often skeptical, um, which is I think very reasonable, um, we're not just random adults or random experts telling them what's going to work for them without really understanding their personal experience. We're simply giving them the scientific principles behind why certain coping strategies might help them and allowing them to explore whether and how those might be helpful over time. E is for empower. We invite youth to serve as helpers or experts, and I'll show you how in just a moment during these interventions, which is flipped from the sort of passive um, patient role that they're used to if they've received therapy before. Uh, saying is believing exercises to solidify learning. These are um, activities where youth teach the ideas that they've just learned to others in order to internalize the concepts themselves. And testimonial stories. We've done a, a whole bunch of focus groups over the years um, and worked with teenagers with lived experience of depression and other difficulties to actually construct narratives of their experiences using the skills that we uh, illustrate in the programs to affect change in their lives. These elements really just align with self-determination theory, which is a well-studied theory of motivated behavior change, whereby promoting a sense of competence, autonomy, and relatedness to others who care about them underlies motivation for behavior change. So that's really what we're trying to accomplish through these interventions. The programs begin um, with an invitation to teens to help us, the researchers, teach these potentially helpful ideas for coping with depression to others who are struggling. So from the get-go, we're not saying this is for you to get better. We are saying this is for you to potentially learn something that could be useful for you, but also to give back if given your experience and knowledge of how to cope with these issues that you've been dealing with for so long. We include very brief lessons on neuroplasticity, why everyone is built for change, even if that change is challenging and doesn't happen overnight, it is possible. Um, or how the brain is wired to help us avoid danger. Evolutionarily, it's adaptive, right? But sometimes the brain can go into overdrive in having us avoid danger to the degree that we're actually avoiding things that are gonna be, gonna be helpful for us or gonna be enjoyable for us. Um, but fortunately, because the brain is so malleable, we can take steps to reverse that cycle. We include written and audio testimonials or narratives um, stories from teens um, who have lived experience of dealing with depression and using the ideas from these interventions to affect change in their lives. In the behavioral activation program, we have a built-in experiment uh, and personalized action plan, by which I mean we have teens rate their mood right now on a scale of zero to 10. They then pick one of three uh, well-tested, very adorable or funny videos um, that we have carefully picked from YouTube. This one is of a porcupine uh, eating a pumpkin and making delightful sounds that nobody ever knows that a porcupine can make. Uh, it's great, I highly recommend it. It has 10 million views on YouTube, it's pretty great. Um, and then we have them rate their mood again. And if their mood, and it reliably does, go up even one point from this porcupine friend, 
that they've now made, they get immediate feedback of, wow, 30 seconds of a random porcupine and you feel detectively better. <laughs> Imagine if you spent even a minute or two minutes a day engaging in values aligned activities, like connecting with others, doing things that are relevant to goals that you have, or doing things just because they're for you and you matter. And we help them make an action plan to doing exactly that um, over the next 48 hours. We also have teens offer advice based on what they've learned in the program to others. And we let teens know that if they give us permission to anonymously share their advice, we will include their feedback in an advice center that we maintain on our lab website um, for other teens to benefit from in the future. We ask questions like, you know, based on what you've learned about our brain and the ability to change, what advice would you give to a peer who felt rejected by someone who thought uh, was a friend? I'm just going to read one of these aloud. Um, I would tell them to remember that even though it feels like these things will never end, nothing is forever. Maybe by being nice to the other kid, you can make him realize that he's being mean and his neurons will help him change for the better, which, you know, they, they got it. Uh, they're very good at giving advice. Um, and in fact, when we ask teens, why did you want to do this? They said to help people. Uh, most of the time, <laughs> not to help themselves. So I think capitalizing on that pro-social motivation that adolescents have is uh, potentially powerful. So what do we compare these interventions to? In this study and the other studies I mentioned and most of our RCTs, the most realistic control group would be nothing because that's the modal reality for most teens seeking support. However, we wanted to make sure that it was these particular self-guided programs and not doing anything sort of positive for 20 minutes that was affecting change. So um, I developed several years ago a sharing feelings project, a, a placebo control single session intervention, a 20 minute activity designed to control for non-specific aspects of going through one of these programs. The content aims to normalize and encourage sharing feelings with other people. It doesn't teach how to identify and share emotions. It doesn't teach any skills, just that you should do it. And sharing feelings is a good thing. So it's designed to mimic advice that kids might receive from a counselor at school if they're having a rough day. And it's face valid. People do not reliably guess that this is a control condition because it resembles what they imagine therapy to be. There's no mention of malleability of personal traits and there's no action plan and no advice giving opportunity. Um, but there are the same number of interactivity points and writing assignments in order to match on those features. So we know that the actual content of the SSI is what's facilitating change if we do see differences. So what did we find? First, we looked at immediate effects because remember those are potentially helpful prognostic predictors, um, comparing both active interventions to the placebo control on shifts in hopelessness and agency. And we found that both active interventions significantly reduced hopelessness from pre to post intervention compared to the placebo control. And both significantly increased a sense of agency or perceived ability to solve problems that arise in their lives compared to the control from before to after the intervention. Of course, these are immediate effects. What we really care about is can, can effects be sustained from a 20 minute activity. Our primary outcome was change in continuously measured depression symptoms from baseline to three month follow up. And we found with a small effect size of 0.18 for both interventions, both active SSIs outperformed the placebo control in reducing depression symptoms three months later. I want to point something out about the, the small effect sizes here. Um, firstly, although these are small, um, it's, I think, largely for two reasons. One, because our sample size was 2,500 people. Um, and of course, we get more precise estimates uh, and less inflation in estimates of effects when we have uh, well-powered studies. And also our placebo control group had a within-group effect size of around 0.2 or 0.3, um, whereas the active interventions had a within-group effect size of 0.4 to 0.6. Um, so there was really, uh, we, we, our, our, our comparison was sufficiently strong um, to trust that this is suggesting a meaningful change. We saw smaller and uh, Significant changes for anxiety and COVID-related trauma for the um, for project personality, but not for the ABC project compared to the control. And to our surprise, this was an exploratory outcome for us that's now sparked a whole other line of research. We found that both interventions significantly reduced rates of restrictive eating from baseline to three-month follow-up, which was present in 60% of our sample. We were not selecting for this. It's just a very common co-occurring symptom in depression. Um, and I'll share a little bit about how we've taken this work in, uh, in different directions moving forward. Of course, we wanted to make sure we were equi equitably serving folks, not just that we were reaching folks traditionally underserved by mental health treatments and studies. 
So a great grad student in our lab, Riley McDaniel, led a study um, to uh, determine whether acceptability and effectiveness differed by racial or ethnic identity or sexual orientation or gender identity, and they did not, which was really great for us um, in being able to say uh, confidently that these are uh, equitably serving different folks from diverse backgrounds. So of course, those were all average effect sizes, right? And by definition, an average overall intervention effect for a group does not apply to any one individual in that group. So we really want to know, you know, how do we know who is going to benefit from an intervention like this, given the heterogeneity in responses to an intervention that's so brief? Well, we've collapsed data from several different trials that we've conducted, including tens of thousands of teenagers and adults to date. And all we have found is things that do not moderate single session intervention effects, uh, which include uh, baseline symptom severity. That was exciting and kind of surprising to us. Uh, and a lot of this work, it's been suggested to me, and I kind of assumed that these interventions might benefit mild or moderately affected folks, but not folks with more severe difficulties. In fact, the folks with more severe difficulties, including suicidal thoughts and behaviors, are actually just more likely to do the interventions because they perceive an immediate need for support. Um, people with mild symptoms aren't seeking out supports in real time. Right. So the only moderating effect we've been able to detect by symptom severity is who is most likely to uptake the interventions, not who is most likely to benefit from them. Likewise, presence of SITBs, uh, self-injurious thoughts and behaviors does not seem to moderate outcomes. Parent uh, and family factors, including parent psychopathology, likewise does not moderate, probably because parents aren't involved in these interventions. And unfortunately, receipt of concurrent treatment doesn't make these interventions any more or less effective. Um, perhaps because there's such heterogeneity in what treatment actually means in real world contexts, but nonetheless, um, these things can be helpful both in tandem with um, and independently of uh, other forms of care. One of our um, other amazing grad students, Isaac Ahuvia, um, built and evaluated a machine learning algorithm to test if we could even identify, you know, best fit treatments based on any range of baseline characteristics. Um, so he was really innovative and used a personalized advantage index approach to test a treatment matching algorithm for our two SSIs that I mentioned before, the behavioral activation and the project personality. Um, however, we found that response predictors were so incredibly similar across those two SSIs that any treatment matching efforts based on baseline criteria would have had virtually no clinical utility which led us to suggest that increasing youth access to both digital SSIs and allowing them choice, uh, which augments that agency that we think is important in these programs, is probably going to carry more public health utility than trying to figure out who's going to benefit a hundredth of a, you know, a point uh, in a difference in Cohen's D uh, in one intervention versus the other. We're doing a lot to explore how to scale up and embed SSIs both within and outside of healthcare systems. And both are really important because in our evidence for clinical trials to date, we're really only capturing youth who get in the door, right? We're not capturing the majority of youth who need help, but never actually interface with health systems at all. So we're working in multiple different directions at once, and this is really exciting work for us to be exploring. I'm not gonna get to all of these, but we have projects in every direction uh, listed on this slide. But together, results are helping us better understand the context, conditions, and populations where SSI do and do not bridge gaps in systems of care. I'll go through a few examples of our recent work. Um, one is uh, developing SSIs for caregivers. Um, I know I've emphasized the importance of offering low intensity, safe supports to teens directly, and at the same time, Young kids aren't in a position to advocate for themselves or seek out any kind of care, and caregivers are necessary advocates to leverage um, for younger children. So uh, drawing on research that's come out of the Yale Child Study Center by Ellie Leibowitz, um, in, uh, looking at the SPACE program targeting just parents um, in treating anxiety in young people, um, my graduate students and I developed Project Empower, which is a single session online intervention that is designed to target parent accommodation of child anxiety and teach parents to promote approach-oriented and brave behaviors in their kids, even though um, helping them avoid things is immediately effective <laughs> in reducing their anxiety. It's not helpful in the long term, right? So we tested whether Project Empower could reduce parent accommodation and 
increased parent distress tolerance, which is a big reason that parents accommodate in the first place. They're stressed when they see their kids stressed um, in a sample of 300 parents. Uh, with high uh, anxiety symptoms because we know anxiety runs in families. We found that Project Empower significantly reduced accommodation of child anxiety over two weeks versus just providing information about anxiety in kids and significantly increased parents' tolerance of distress over two weeks versus an information-only control. And we've since partnered with Dr. Jiller and Reich May uh, at University of Miami to culturally adapt and tailor and pilot test Project Empower for Haitian Creole and Spanish speaking caregivers. Um, and this is primarily because much of the accommodation focused research in child anxiety has focused on white upper middle class families. Um, and we wanted to be sure that families who are living in circumstances where they do face real danger and accommodation might take on a different meaning um, than just sort of giving in to the kids' desires to avoid. Uh, we wanted to make sure it's still stuck and uh, we're finding that it does and we're excited to be expanding the resources on that front. Another path to dissemination that we've been exploring is making our SSIs free and anonymously available to anybody. I will preface this by saying that I've learned from this project that making things free is not a dissemination plan. But in any case, <laughs> we still do it because we think it's important. Um, and we have this resource on our lab website for anybody to take advantage of. Um, project YES, which stands for Youth Empowerment and Support, um, has three steps. Anybody can choose one of uh, three, soon to be four different activities on our website. They can, if they want to, complete some questionnaires before and after the programs to uh, help us understand how to make them better um, and share their advice based, um, based on their own experience and what they learn in the intervention they choose for coping with depression and anxiety. Um, and we maintain a list of advice that's screened and deemed appropriate uh, in our advice center, which is on Project Yes website for everybody to benefit from. In initial trials, rollouts on social media, we found that all, all the interventions on Project Yes produced essentially the same effects we've seen in our RCTs. We were then fortunate to work with the City of San Antonio Health District, their public health department, to um, adapt and translate Project Yes um, as a resource for young people in San Antonio, Texas, who were bilingual uh, Spanish-English speakers. Um, and we did that by uh, uh, putting together a youth advisory board with our partners in San Antonio, Texas, working with San Antonio young people to make sure their voices and perspectives and stories were embedded into the interventions, um, and disseminating it as a citywide resource in about a thousand kids. Um, and we found that the effects were quite similar um, across other trials, which suggests that this intervention set is useful potentially both in Spanish and English for diverse kids. More recently, given that sort of surprise effect we found on restrictive eating, our lab has been increasingly interested in applying SSI approaches to reducing disordered eating and eating disorder uh, related behaviors and symptoms. Um, an amazing post back in my lab, uh, uh, Arielle Smith led, led, led the way on this uh, intervention design and I'm happy to share it with you now. So Project Body Neutrality is an online single session intervention designed for teenagers who, experience, who are experiencing both mood difficulties and um, body image difficulties. Um, and it's sort of an, uh, an alternative to body positivity, which is increasingly criticized and not loved <laughs> um, by eating disorder advocates. Uh, and body positivity suggests that you should just love your body no matter what it looks like. Um, however, a lot of people find that message somewhat invalidating and difficult to actually do if you're struggling with eating, eating disorder or disordered eating. Body neutrality is an alternative to that approach suggesting that you don't necessarily always have to love how your body looks. It's understandable that you'll have better and worse days, but you can always appreciate what your body allows you to do, the functions, the functionality appreciation, right? Um, and this interactive online activity, which again uses all the same elements I shared before, um, led to significant increases in functionality appreciation, decreases in body dissatisfaction, decreases in hopelessness, and increases in perceived agency from pre to post intervention. So it's targeting both those generalized um, outcomes that we see shifted in depression-focused interventions and um, body image or disordered eating specific outcomes. We're really excited to be testing this in a larger RCT. This article just was published uh, in iGED yesterday. So you can go ahead and read it. We're also partnering now with uh, the National Eating Disorders Association to disseminate more information about body neutrality using uh, this intervention, not just as uh, an interventional tool, but as a teaching tool uh, to introduce another way of understanding body image uh, to teens. Um, there's also uh, 
in, in terms of expanding access to SSIs outside healthcare systems, um, it's really critical to figure out ways to go directly to where teens already are. Um, and this has been accomplished in many ways so far uh, in the literature, like going through schools or going through primary care. Um, but where most kids are in reality is online in social media spaces. Um, so we've been able to form a partnership with a nonprofit, uh, a digital mental health nonprofit called COCO to directly embed our single session evidence-based interventions into social media platforms. So people don't have to download a new app. They can stay within the platforms they know and trust, do something immediately um, in a very short period of time and potentially get some benefits. Um, we also embedded, uh, we, we embedded our SSIs for this particular project into Tumblr as just-in-time supports, which were offered to folks using Tumblr, um, which still exists. I was surprised, honestly, I was using it in high school, so. Um, but it does still exist. And based on search patterns, like if teens would search for things like suicide or therapy or depression, Coco would pop up and offer them one of several supports, including our SSIs. For this in, um, integration project, we reduced the length of our SSIs that I shared previously from around 25 minutes to around six minutes, because that's what somebody will do online. That's the length of time they will spend on something if they are not getting paid for it. Um, therefore, that was the length the interventions needed to be. Um, so we, we did our best to in, um, in, uh, retain the elements we think are useful for the intervention. They were completed by almost 6,200 teens within a year naturalistically. And we found that hopelessness reduced at least as much in our Tumblr-based SSIs as they did in our RCTs, but completion rates were quite a bit higher probably because these were six minute interventions, not 20. More recently, we've tested whether SSIs can be helpful for increasing uptake of crisis resources for folks who are in really acute distress. Um, social media platforms have embedded AI algorithms already, like virtually all of them to flag users who they think might be in crisis based on search terms or the posts that they interact with. They usually, when they're detected as being at risk, receive something like this. Um, hotlines, text lines, directing, directing them uh, to access resources. But most people in crisis do not use these, even when they are presented. Um, in qualitative research, um, we know, you know folks perceive these as kind of invalidating, impersonal perfunctory things that the social media platforms have to do for legal reasons, but they don't actually care. Um, so we wanted to see if a social media embedded hyper brief SSI could boost crisis resource uptake. So partnering with Coco again, um, we tested whether a one minute, but really like less than a minute, enhanced crisis response SSI could perform better than crisis response as usual, as in just offering the text lines. Um, in increasing use of crisis resources for people flagged in social media as needing support. The SSI included uh, one sentence of psychoed uh, sharing the prevalence of suicidal thoughts and behaviors, one sentence of a story from a peer who benefited from using a crisis resource, and user choice, like which one is going to fit you best right now to try hotlines, peer support, which is something that COCO offers, or self-help activities. Um, this was tested across multiple platforms. Um, 355 people ended up funneling into the project. Um, and what we found was that the enhanced crisis response SSI significantly reduced hopelessness from um, crisis or risk detection to 10 minutes later compared to just offering hotlines. And uptake of a crisis resource doubled um, in our enhanced crisis response SSI condition compared to just offering hotlines and text lines. So this is an exceptionally light touch intervention that can help connect people with services. So SSIs can target not just symptoms directly, uh, but also utilization of other supports. Um, recently, we've been co-designing with LGBTQ teens for SSI dissemination. Um, and this is because a large majority of folks who do our interventions when we make them freely available are LGBTQ plus teens who often cannot access care um, because they're not able to communicate with adults in their lives about their needs or their identities. Um, in co-designing uh, our existing interventions with this group, uh, we learned from them pretty quickly that they liked behavioral activation and they liked the idea that the brain can change and therefore depression can change, but they didn't see any mention of systemic and structural forces that make dealing with mental health a lot harder for people who hold their identities. 
And we were like, you're absolutely right. And that feels wrong to just mention at the end of one of our existing interventions. So let's make a new one together. And we did, and we called this Project RISE, which teaches minority stress theory to teenagers. It teaches how and why experiencing life as a minoritized person um, can be really challenging because of structures of privilege and oppression that we live with every day. Uh, and we help them make an action plan by first validating that their experiences are real and really challenging, and then helping them identify small things they may be able to do in their lives to construct a more affirming and supportive environment for them and get through those really difficult times where minority stress is, being, uh, is, is rearing its head. In a sample of 538 LGBTQ teens, we ran an RCT and found that RISE significantly improved hopelessness, self-hate, and internalized stigma versus an information-only control. Um, we didn't select for ele elevated symptoms in the sample, but we found them because this group is just at such high risk um, for so many different kinds of mental health difficulties. And we're excited to test this uh, more thoroughly uh, with different partners moving forward. Um, we also um, use SSIs to support folks who are waiting for treatment, which is a ubiquitous and very extreme problem in pretty much every clinic I've given talks at or spoken with or worked in. Um, people are waiting six months to a year for treatment, even after they reach out for help, which is already hard enough to do. Um, and people get worse when they're waiting for treatments. There have been RC, there, there have been trials comparing being on a wait list to just not seeking treatment at all. And being on a wait list is predictive of worse outcomes and trajectories than not seeking treatment at all, because people's hopes for being supported are being denied, right? And that's very demoralizing. So I wanted to explore whether a therapist-delivered solution-focused brief therapy SSI could reduce hopelessness, improve agency, and prevent symptoms from getting worse in people on lengthy waiting lists for outpatient mental health care. Um, I originally thought that this intervention would be tested for peer-to-peer -peer delivery, so college students, uh, resident assistants delivering it to other college students in hallways, uh, but it was a lot easier for me as a clinical psych professor to first test this in our in-house clinic um, with uh, early, uh, early in their training therapists who had no background in, in delivering treatment yet. Very brief intervention. If you're interested in this program, please do reach out. We have training videos, mock session videos, everything's free, like all the other stuff. Um, but basically we now have this as a routine part of what we offer um, at Stony Brook Clinics for mental health outpatient care for adolescents and for adults and for parents of young children. And what we found um, in delivering this program, both on teletherapy um, and, oh, I like the hearts, um, <laughs> thanks, uh, and not on teletherapy, um, is that people who receive the single session intervention, which is taken up by about 70%, 75% of our waiting list at this point, um, they show significant declines in hopelessness and significant increases in readiness for change, even though they're already ready for change because they're reaching out for help, right? So we saw further improvements there and actual decreases in anxiety and depression while they're waiting for treatment over at least two weeks, which is great because increases in symptoms while waiting for care are the norm. Um, and this is with a totally heterogeneous sample clinically. Anybody can be seen at our clinics. Um, and the SSC is specifically designed to address and help people get one step closer to a future that matters to them. So it's completely problem agnostic and can be used with pretty much any issue. Um, right now, I, I give a lot of trainings for the SSC, um, and as far as I know, um, it is being delivered to adults, teens, and patients on wait lists in schools and primary care and in emergency departments in at least seven states and five countries, um, based on the feedback that I've gotten from folks I've given our materials to and um, offered consultation and support and implementation. Um, I recently uh, signed with um, Oxford University Press to write and publish an SSC therapist guide with my grad student, Jenna Sung, who's been intimately involved in all of this work. So that'll be out soon. Um, and we have two partnerships, one with um, CCBH, uh, which is in Pennsylvania, to test the feasibility of pathways to Medicaid reimbursement for the SSC, which is a super critical next step for implementation at scale. Um, that'll start in September. And I'm also working with Optum, part of United Health to figure out how do we make these things reimbursable? Uh, because right now there is no pathway to reimbursement because if you're spending the first session intervening, you don't have a diagnosis yet. So what do you bill for? Uh, this has been a really big challenge in pretty much every clinic I've worked with. And it's a huge frustration for many people, uh, but hopefully working with the, the payers directly will be a promising path to getting an answer. Um, lastly, I'm really excited to be engaging in more public outreach with this new book. 
Um, I hope you read it. I hope you like it. Um, it makes the case for why I think all of this needs to be embedded in healthcare systems like yesterday. Um, and it uh, incorporates a lot of lived experiences and, and personal stories in addition to the science that I've been talking about uh, in making that case. That's all I have. I'm happy to take questions if there's time. <laughs>